live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters. You're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. How's it going, gentlemen? Welcome again to yet another episode of the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. My name is Scott McKay at Scott McKay on Twitter, Real Scott McKay on Instagram, Scott McKay on YouTube. You can find us on the web at mountaintoppodcast.com. As always, I invite you to come join us, our group of single-minded men of character on Facebook. The Facebook group is the Mountaintop Summit. With me today is a new friend of mine. She's very lovely and very talented. Her name is Preeti Upala, and she is coming from Hollywood, California, although not originally. She may talk a little bit more about that. And she's got a very interesting line of work. She is a thought leader, international speaker, and media personality in the areas of political commentary and spirituality. Now, the reason why I invited her to join us today is because, first of all, she's a scintillating conversationalist. Second of all, she's a woman, and you guys love when I have women on the show. And third, and most importantly, she wants to talk about, and I wanted her to talk about it too, believe me, this is a great conversation brewing here. What the feminine wants from the masculine. And I think you're going to like her pretty. Welcome aboard. Howdy, Scott. And uh, welcome to um, all your audience. I'm so honored to be on your wonderful show. I've been following it. And it's it's interesting. It's always great to expand my own horizons and have conversations with all sorts of people. And a male audience is certainly usually not my norm. I, it's either women only or it's a mixed group, it's usually very international. But uh, this is such an important topic for us, I think, in the world at large. So I'm so thrilled to have these sort of deep, interesting conversations with yourself and hopefully engage with your audience at the end. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll tell you what, it's a major vote of confidence that you've been following this show, listening to it, and you haven't been completely disgusted and offended yet. And you're still here. That's great. You know, we always love that. So, uh, you know, in all seriousness, I'm excited about this particular show because I think a lot of guys, pretty, they kind of struggle with this idea of, okay, I know on the surface or I know on paper what it means to be masculine, but I don't have any, you know, villains to, fend off. I don't have to go hunt and kill my food. It's kind of interesting how the whole dynamic of masculinity finds its function nowadays in modern society. And meanwhile, all these guys are thinking women still want a masculine man. And I really like feminine women. So what do women want from a man nowadays? I'd love to just let you riff on that because we've talked about it, you know, kind of in passing on this show before, uh, more than in passing, if I'm honest. But I don't want you to have any kind of third person influence to your answer. I want to hear what you have to say. The real question in the world today is, what does it mean to be feminine? And what does it mean to be masculine? In a way, these definitions have become very nebulous and ambiguous today. You made a reference to the caveman mentality. So it's really a two-pronged response. One is, yes, we are not in the cave days anymore, and men don't have to go out and hunt for the food. However, the woman isn't back waiting in the cave for her knight in shining armor, so to speak. So we've really evolved from that. We've moved on and relationships have evolved. However, emotionally, Biologically, and on a very subconscious level, men and women still behave with that caveman mentality. The man today is still, to some level, expected to be sort of the strong um, protector, and the woman is always going to be looking for security. A straight woman, especially, that's just it built into her DNA. Uh, and yes, we we are very independent today, and I think we're really fighting for parity. And in some ways, we have it. But um, I'm not so sure that she actually wants that uh, idea of, you know what, I don't need a man. The, the feminists would love to have you believe that. But a good woman, just uh, an average, uh, your everyday woman uh, looking to give and receive love, uh, she still would love the, the security and sort of somebody to be there for her. So it's about finding that a uh, beautiful balance and the thin line between the two. I think it's a dance that both have to uh, tread carefully because I find a lot of encroachment of these spaces from both. And then 
weaponizing and politicizing all of this, political parties or uh, sort of uh, these human rights people, especially the feminist. So, um, so that's my answer to your question, that it's become very vague. And I think it's important to uh, get down to the real meaning of it uh, and get very real with it. Preeti, you know, you mentioned the dance of masculinity and femininity, which is a recurring theme around here. And you also talked about how perhaps there's a fine line between masculinity and femininity. I'd love for you to describe that, because I think most people would think of masculinity and femininity as being polar opposites that attract each other with that polarity. So where is this fine line that you speak of? Well, it, you know, when you look at the yin yang sort of male feminine, uh, it ultimately it's a union. So, you know, we are mirrors of each other. Uh, masculinity is uh, still very sexy. Confidence is very sexy to a woman. It would be, I think, a lie to say that women don't want confident men. In fact, we, we say we want the sweet, sweetheart, uh, soft man. But trust me, most real women will get very bored very quickly. So confidence is sexy. We do want a man who has himself and things under control should we ever need it. Uh, ultimately, what the man is supposed to do is to allow the woman to be her feminine self. And this is the the place where I think one of the big problems lie, because men today still think, well, it's two things. Either they think, uh, oh, I have to be dominant and I'm going to be her protector. And then they really go into alpha mode, which is such a turn off. Or they think, oh, this whole issue of toxic masculinity is around. I think they just want me to not show that side of me. So let me just be the softy. And that also is not very attractive. So women are looking for confidence and strength in a man, but not overt uh, power. You know, they want like a quiet strength and confidence. They need to have faith in their man. And uh, ultimately, a man's job is to allow the woman to be her uh, feminine self. So to be the soft, vulnerable, beautiful, sensual, uh, sexual, erotic, open self. And how often are we seeing this in a society today, especially here in, in America? And I mean, I'm from California. It's like, don't even let's not go there, shall we? Because here it's almost like a reversal of these roles going on. And it's very, very scary for me to as an, uh, as a sort of a an uh, analyst and a researcher to observe this. Um, so the dance is there to be uh, had, but uh, it's uh, very, very uh, uh, distorted right now. And and thanks to Me Too and Time's Up, it's become even more complex. It's added another layer where men are almost scared to even make eye contact and approach and say hello should somebody cry uh, harassment or uh, oh they're scared it's just too overbearing and at the same time all my female friends all they do is complain that there's no good man around so we have bought ourselves to this situation today and the social media has not helped and the political uh, environment has not helped either because I find uh, political parties kind of weaponizing this this little situation. But it's very dangerous, I think, for the future of humanity, because we do need to procreate. We do have to come together. We are looking for love and light. You know, we are looking for that soulmate situation. And uh, you uh, cannot start that story unless you uh, get this right, you know, and then men have to realize that women still look for strength and confidence. And uh, women need to be honest about that, I think. Sometimes they tow the feminist line uh, of being completely independent and not needing a man. But deep down, they, they know that that's not true. They're fooling themselves, you know. So they also need to be, I think, honest. And uh, once they do that, I think it takes two to tango. I think there needs to be a shift for both the sexes to sort of overcome this. You know, I would love for you to talk at length about this shift that you think needs to happen. And we'll get there. But I have to come clean with these guys. I knew how passionate you were about this and how much you were willing to really stick it to feminists in the name of really appreciating men and women. And I believe it's going to be quite refreshing for these guys to hear what you're saying. One of the things that's already occurring to me is you are using 
different words than we tend to use around here, which is really a nice, fresh challenge. You were talking about the framework of men allowing women to be feminine. And I think sometimes if we take that phrase prima facie, we're thinking, okay, well, he has to defer to the woman. He has to let the woman be in charge. And I would hope any guy listening to this isn't tripped up by your choice of words, because what we talk about around here is enabling women. And that brings in this side of masculinity where we are protectors and providers. We just aren't heavy handed about it. We're not telling women what to do. We're not forcing them into anything. We're not being abusive about it. We're not being unthinking or unfeeling or uncaring about it. More, it's about providing safety and security to the environment that a man and a woman are moving, living, and having their being in. So she can be freed up to bring all those wonderful feminine gifts to us that we're the beneficiaries of. And I think that's a fascinating way to look at it because you were talking earlier about how it's a fine line, but at the same time, it is yin and yang. We are opposites. We are different. And I think in many ways, what you've hit upon here is that it can be both. You talked about men being confident and how women love that. And see, I would argue, Preeti, that men love confident women also. So is the confidence, is that self-assuredness, is that belief in one's own competence really a masculine feminine thing? Or is that one of those things that kind of walks along the border of the yin and yang? If we believe that we should be attractive to the other gender, if we believe we represent our own gender traits well, then that will give both a man and a woman confidence to attract each other. You know what I mean? Yes. Firstly, just to touch on the the verbiage, yes, I much prefer allowing than enabling. When you said the word enabling, it just I can just imagine it would trigger so many women because it uh, makes the presumption that we are not able to uh, practice that function on our own. Like we are sort of a robot and only when you press the on button, then we're going to uh, function. But allowing means that it's already there. We are ready to go. You just need to give us the space to express ourselves. So I think semantics is so important. And even women use this word enabling and some other words sometimes that becomes counterproductive. So I think it's so important to use the right words, I think, when, you, when we address these issues. Well, yeah, fair enough. I mean, to call someone an enabler, in the psychotherapy world, often has a very negative connotation, right? Um, but I don't know, Prady. I, I'm going to give most people the benefit of the doubt, if they're normal, well-adjusted people, that they're not going to get offended so easily. Because when I hear the word allow, to me, that's an implication that permission was granted. And to my sensibilities, if anything, that's more offensive than to say I'm enabling something by helping it to happen. If I'm allowing something, that means I'm the gatekeeper. I say yes or no. You don't get to be feminine until I say you get to be feminine is how I can only imagine some people reading the word allow in that context. And admittedly, you know, I'm not offended by either choice of words. I'm playing devil's advocate here. But I guess it all adds up to how people are overthinking this and looking for reasons to drive a barrier between men and women when really men and women are supposed to be a team. We're supposed to be there in support of each other, no matter how you slice it, allowing, enabling, helping out, making the world safe for whatever you want to say. Really, men and women should be in a wonderful symphony with each other, empowering each other, enabling, helping, allowing each other to thrive as men and women respectively and as a couple together, right? You're right. Um, and permission, actually, neither needs permission from each other to be their authentic self. But uh, and glad you brought out that point, because, you know, everything about women is like fluid and dynamic and sort of flow, you know, and it's very sort of they, they, give, they receive and give the, the back and forth and stuff. Uh, it's sort of a conduit for that. Um, but back to uh, confidence, you know, uh, women uh, want a man who is confident of, number one, who he is. You know, what, does he know who he is, what he brings to the table? What sort of uh, great um, assets does he have that he can bring to the relationship? But more importantly, does he know what he's looking for? Does he know what kind of partner uh, he wants? Because that makes him more appealing and attractive when you know who you are and what kind of woman you want. And then when you do approach her, she knows that, you know what, 
this guy knew exactly what he wanted and he came to me. That says actually a lot about me, which is great. Look, a woman is like a rough diamond. She will have facets. She will have polished and unpolished facets to her. So the man needs to know what kind of facets he wants so that he can pick the right diamond. And if need be, look, facets are assets that if they're not polished, you know what? It's your job to help polish that too. And I think a good woman would totally be okay with that. So this is how men need to look at, um, you know, when they're looking for somebody, because they always complain that, oh, where are the good women? I can't find anyone. And yet often they have not made this sort of mental list of exactly uh, what they want and exactly who they are, uh, who are they bringing to the relationship. Uh, women don't do it either, by the way. You know, I, they really, I think both need to know what they want because when you don't know what you want, how are you go, going to go about finding it? And when it's right in front of you, how will you ever know that it's right there? So it's, we have our work cut out for the both of us. And there's obviously, we will go into it in more detail, I'm sure, as the show progresses, uh, you know, specific things that women desire from their man that men don't even know that are so important to women. And often these things are actually small and intangible, uh, things that they, are, that they could be doing but are not. Well, I'll tell you what. First of all, straight away, as soon as we're done recording here, I'm going to go register facetsorassets.com. I'm going to own that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was excellent. <laughs> Someone's got to go get that domain. I'm pretty sure you'll beat me to it. You deserve to. You coined it. But anyway, in all seriousness, this idea of knowing who we are as men so we can better understand who the woman is we're looking for and how all of that relates to women and attraction and their feminine receiving of a masculine presence, I think is so absolutely obvious when it's spelled out as eloquently as you just did, Prady. But I think a lot of guys just wing it. We're thinking, oh, you know what? I, I don't really know who I am yet. I don't know what I'm passionate about. A lot of people don't even have a core belief system. For many people, and you're a political commentator, so hopefully I won't trigger you too hard here, but I think politics has become the spirituality for a lot of people, Madam Political and Spirituality Commentator. I think that's what's going on. People lack a core belief system in our secular humanist world, and they're basically worshiping a god of politics. No matter what you see out there, it's being politicized. And most people, I actually did this exercise just this morning and talked to my Facebook guys about it. What you can do is you can look in your feed, and I'm blessed with people who are on both sides of the aisle as friends, because I'm okay with that. Nobody can talk about COVID-19 without circling back to politics. And their side of the aisle is responsible for everything that's good that has happened in response to COVID-19 in whatever country they're in. And by the way, if you go look at how people react in other countries other than your own, you're going to see a very similar pattern, which may make you throw up your hands and laugh, but it's there. Meanwhile, all the people on the other side of the aisle think their side of the aisle can do no wrong, and all the mistakes and all the blame is ascribed to a politician or politicians on the other side. When really, I don't think the virus even votes, let alone for one side or the other. Meanwhile, you know, back in the male-female world of masculinity and femininity, people are politicizing male and female when male and female existed long before politics. So this idea, if we know what we are, if we know who we are, not just as political people, but as spiritual people, as people who have decided our ethical structure, people with passion, people with motivation, people with ambition, people with idiosyncratic likes and dislikes. If we know who we are as men, gentlemen, guess what? Only then will a woman know who the hell we are. <laughs> and if she's left wondering who the hell we are, because we don't even know, where's the safety and security in that, right? Now, further, once we present with who the hell we are and what we're about, Prady, you're absolutely stone cold on the money. You hit the nail on the head. And then what happens after that is a woman knows if you know who you are and you know what you're about, yes, you will have a much clearer representation of who it is you're looking for. 
And that makes the woman feel safe, secure, chosen, allowed, empowered, enabled, whatever word you want to use. It makes her feel like, you know what? This man put some thought into this. He put some emotion into this. He put some heart and soul and being into this. And yes, he has recognized me as the woman who's right for him. And that makes her feel incredibly safe. And see, here's the thing. A lot of times men are very, very confused by the choice of words women use. So when a woman says something like this, and I want you to comment on it, right? Ready? Here we go. I love a man who goes after what he wants. I think women know exactly what they mean, and they mean what we just described. But all a man hears is, wait a minute, if I go after what I want, I'm going to be some sort of handsy rapist, and I'm going to get thrown in jail by the Me Too police. I can't just go around going after what I want. Ah, but men are thinking about it in terms of a sex act, and women are thinking about it in terms of a more holistic relational stance, aren't they? Absolutely right. Um, The sexiest organ in the human body is actually the brain. So use it or lose it, baby. (laughs) Sex for women is actually not really physical. It's more emotional and mental. For men, initially, it starts as being physical. And then when a bond is established, usually through intimacy, uh, then the it does manifest into something much more emotional. Um, So, you know, it's very important to know when a woman says, I want a man that you know knows what he wants and goes after it, she's thinking in terms of his life goals, his purpose, his career, uh, who he wants to be in the world, his legacy, and of course, a good woman too, which that she's meaning herself. But the guy right. is thinking with his, you know, the other organ in, in, in the body, which is not the, the sexiest organ. And so it's like the connotations. I just wanted to uh, add to your point earlier about the lack of core beliefs. So true. So the secular humanist movement is a religion unto itself. I mean, you can lump in that with all the other faiths. For example, at an intra-faith council, you can have the secular humanists themselves because I think it's a cult and they have their own cult leaders and they're almost like deified. So very important. Like I'm a person of great faith. And I think core beliefs do come from good family upbringing and connection to your to your divine and to your faith. It's so important. Um, so it, absolutely, I think both parties uh, around the world, the left and the right, politicize this issue. It's a hot topic. Um, now, feminism in the 21st century has morphed into something completely different, very unpalatable to what it used to be, you know, used to be about rights and uh, liberation. Now it's turned into this man-hating, male bashing, venomous, entitlement-driven form of identity politics and toxic intersectionality. And now activists are basically hijacking it. And um, they're pushing for equality of outcome instead of equality of opportunity. And this is where this reversal of gender balance happens. Because now the women are becoming hotter, the men are becoming softer, and they're almost ashamed of their inherent masculine power. So this leaves the woman yearning for this divine masculine that she so wishes to feel, but she has to generate it within herself because she thinks, well, he's not going to do it, so let me do it. And this is where she's running around with the pants now, and the whole thing is so lopsided. And when a woman is forced to be the man, there is no way that she can be her true feminine self. So this is the issue that's going on. And uh, it's become weaponized around the world. It's the same case no matter where you go. And uh, nobody is talking about this except for a few people like myself. Uh, so it's, it is very important. Ultimately, look, men, women, they are mirrors. And they are divinely supposed to come together. And they perfectly marry into each other. Right. So we have to get back to those very basic kind of human needs and the the divine plan, so to speak, for us. Yeah, I call it God's dirty little trick (laughs) to get us to procreate. I don't understand why we as men love women so much and vice versa, but it absolutely is what it is. And, you know, I would add to that something I've said on this show frequently that I believe masculinity and femininity are a global language, a lot like mathematics. 
And, you know, you said something just a minute or so ago about wherever you go, there's this struggle between the political correctness and that agenda of feminism and the reality of masculinity and femininity. I would disagree. If you go places where there's not a lot of media, especially social media, masculinity and femininity seem to be doing just fine in their natural, normal state. It's when there's a politically weaponized approach, like you were talking about, and you're absolutely right about that, that people get crossed up. And here's my brief synopsis of what I think's gone on here. Once you have women being able to vote and, you know, there isn't such oppression. I mean, do men and women have equal rights? Totally. I think it's better than it used to be. But I think people still have jobs to do. You can still follow the money. There are still donations coming in. And we've got to come up with a new cause that's burning a hole in the table because it's such a freaking crisis. And now it's masculinity as we know it is horrible. So men are being told their masculinity is toxic and we're given nothing to replace it with. Just stop doing that. Be a better man, which drives me nuts. Just stop doing the bad stuff and do better. You know, hashtag do better. And men are like, well, I guess the only thing I can think to do if I'm not allowed to be a man anymore is, is to be softer and be more feminine and, you know, teach my sons to back off and not be so aggressive. And then what do the women do? They become more masculine. Once they soften the men up, they take the masculinity on. And what I've noticed is having pressured men to stop being masculine because of toxic masculinity, what they've conveniently done is change the narrative such that there is no room left there in that discussion for what virtuous masculinity is. This providing, this protecting, this allowing, this empowering, this presiding, leading, being courageous. And what are women doing? They're doing that stuff. So they're telling men to stop being toxic in their masculinity, and then they're busy appropriating virtuous masculinity for themselves without cluing men on what's up there. Now, see, here's where I think the disconnect is, and here's where I can't wait to hear your response. I can disarm any feminist, Prady. You know what I can tell them to do that? Here it is. I believe femininity is the higher calling. And they'll always go, okay, I'm listening. See, I think it's a damn shame that feminine women would rather try to be masculine when really all masculinity is there for is to allow femininity, to use your term. Mm. Because, see, women bring everything we live for on weekends, the joy, the fun, the comfort, the party, the enjoyment, the exhilaration are all the feminine gifts. And we as men, if we have the lights on, someone's home in there, are the beneficiaries for having allowed women to thrive in that context. So when women are busy trying to appropriate masculinity because they're under the misguided perception that that's where all the power is, uh-uh. This balance has been there all along. The power of masculinity exists almost solely to provide, protect, preside, allow, enable, whatever word you want to choose, femininity to happen. Because that's where the beauty is. Absolutely. Uh, I totally agree with you. And just uh, your point earlier about when you go to countries where there isn't uh, media prevalent, the point is, well, where is that? Show me a country where social media isn't all pervasive. And guess what? It's actually more pervasive in the developing world than I would say even in the West sometimes. Like you, no matter where you go, everybody has a cell phone. They may not have running water, but they have a smartphone these days. And uh, the politics has been around for a long time and is loud and alive everywhere in the world, whether it's democracies or theocracies or even in a place like China. Trust me, China is extremely political as well. Okay, well, yeah. let me stop you and let me give you credit where credit is due. Okay. I am basing that judgment call on travels that may have happened a decade or more ago. Mm -hmm. So yes, a place like Cambodia or Nepal may be a lot more loaded down with social media now than they were simply mm -hmm. five or six years ago. Granted, and I will absolutely give you 1000% of the credit for setting me straight on there. But I've also hung out with the Maasai tribe mm -hmm. and I've shown kids images of themselves on video where they have not even looked into a mirror before. <laughs> okay. And it was the same there, masculinity and femininity. And I've also been to North Korea and the women are so feminine. You can't believe it in North Korea. So in the instance, you can find an enclave where there 
hasn't been this incredible oversaturation of media, you are indeed still going to find masculinity and femininity. And indeed, also, if you go back before the brief history of social media, even into antiquity, masculinity and femininity had some continuity to it, if not ultimate continuity to it. So yes, in the here and now, most places are oversaturated by social media. And I couldn't agree with you more. That's to the detriment of really most things people believe at their core, because the angry people are going to grab the mic and try to turn everybody against what's right. And for a while there, you know, this is kind of budding all over the world still. It's new. That's where you're getting people who feel like they have to believe things that are completely preposterous, contrary to anything anybody's even thought about, or else they're going to piss off all the angry people. And then political correctness runs amok, and everybody feels, my goodness, I'm going to be canceled by quote unquote cancel culture if I'm just true to what I honestly believe makes sense. If that makes sense, even that alone doesn't make sense to a lot of people anymore. I just really fear for our future in that regard. But I did want to acknowledge you're absolutely correct. Most places right now are oversaturated by social media, and it is an issue. It may be the defining issue that really is putting masculinity and femininity at risk, huh? Yes, I, I absolutely. And, you know, the points that you made, they, they just add to what I was saying about how uh, there's been a weaponization and politicization oh, yeah. of, you know, this is identity politics and intersectionality at its highest. And the funny thing is that they're basically replacing, you know, these are the feminists and the the radical feminists. They are replacing toxic masculinity with some version of toxic femininity, right? They're stripping women from their inherent feminine um, qualities and essence. And they're saying, no, you need to be the dude. You need to wear the pants. You tell him where to stick it, honey. And you stand up and you don't need no man. As long as it's not in her. Yeah, yes. And usually it's <laughs> like a, they're not you know, they're not straight anyway. So because of their own makeup, it doesn't really, they, they don't really want that. Uh, they don't want a man anywhere near them because they are the man themselves. So they'll basically tell other women uh, to sort of enact the same. And uh, I think the, the issue here also is the distortion of power. Women and men sometimes thinking that the power is in this alpha mode, that the power is in success and visibility and um, status and all those things that are uh, traditionally sort of um, associated with uh, either male kind of jobs or, or males themselves. And even women are, they've bought into this sort of lies that they've been fed, that um, power only lies in the masculine sort of arena. And you need to like, give up on this being the mother and the wife and just go after where the real power is. And this sort of uh, idea of uh, toxic femininity has crept up, you know, and that's where that whole male hating uh, sort of uh, obnoxious entitlement driven uh, sort of a movement comes in. And it's not good for the women. It's not good for the uh, men either. Uh, I, I would say that only 7% of women around the world actually would um, describe themselves as staunch feminists, which says a lot. You would think by the way it's politicized, you would think it's 60% of the women, but it's like less than 10, which tells you that actually there is a incredible amount of dissatisfaction with this uh, notion and movement in the first place. It's just that these people have the, the loudspeaker. They, their voice is the one being heard. Right. It's not the 93 percent of the other women uh, who are quite happy with their inherent feminine nature. So because it's the only loud voice being heard, you know, people just think that that's the norm and it's not. So, again, media plays a role in distorting sort of the real facts on the ground, so to speak. But it is the, the, the big problem moving forward, which is why I'm, I speak and write a lot on these issues, because I just feel that it's not being spoken about. And I think men don't speak about it enough. And sadly, I don't think they will be given an opportunity to. They will be shut down immediately. They'll be called misogynist if it will have this conversation that we are having now. So it, unfortunately, the woman has to bring these things up. Yeah. I mean, I've heard it said that it's women who are going to end feminism not men. Yes. And I, I agree with that, or at least lessen the negative cultural impact of it. And to what you just said about feminism, really, well, to put it the way I like to put it, having a branding problem. Mm. 
compared to in the past. You know, formal polling supports that. Fox and others have said, okay, do you believe women should have equal rights and be able to vote and get paid the same? And, you know, some 90 percent ish number of people believe that's true. Then they'll ask the same group, do you think of yourself as a feminist? And the numbers are like what you said, an extremely small percentage of people actually identify as a feminist in terms of actually using the term to describe themselves. And what I've done is I've kind of thought of it as two terms, feminism with a small f and feminism capitalized. Feminism being, you know, rights and privileges being equal to that of men and feminism capitalized as this movement that has a political and indeed financial agenda behind it. So I think that's fascinating. You know, Pretty, I think a lot of these guys are thinking, okay, great. We've talked about a lot of lofty ideas here, some practical things, but what can I do right now that for lack of a better way to put it, will impress women and really turn on the feminine without, of course, trying to impress women, because we all know that doesn't work, right? Because that sounds too needy. What does the feminine want for guys to do right off the bat, even when men are meeting a woman, perhaps for the first time? And if you want, you can throw in a couple pointers for relationships too, if you'd like. All right, great. I love practical ideas because at the end of the day, Philosophy is great, but you need tangible points on how to actually make some of these happen. So women, I don't think men realize this, but women love details. The the devil is always in the details. We want a man that pays attention. So whether this is a first encounter or uh, you're dating or you're even in a relationship or marriage, pay attention. All the money and charm in the world mean nothing if you don't show to her that you pay attention to what she's saying because it demonstrates that you care. Trust me, we know when a man cares about us or not. Sometimes some women go along with it for their whatever intentions, and they know that his heart isn't there. But most good women know uh, when somebody doesn't care about them, it's rather obvious. So it may be small, but Paying attention goes a long way. So take notes when she's saying something, especially when clearly it's important to her. Make a note because it will be used against you in the future, possibly. Like she'll bring it up and then <laughs> in. So married women know this, you know, so you need to um, hear her out, give, you know, respect her. I understand that she has, you know, fears and concerns and, uh, and, and as do you, and you must express yourself too. So definitely it's the little things that count. You know, we want to hear and feel like we're special and unique. So the other thing is, I think all men out there, all, all uh, the good men listening, if you haven't done this already, please take some time and make a, a sort of mental list of qualities that, number one, you possess in yourself, that you're proud of. And polish those more and make sure you, next time you meet a woman you like, talk about them. Guess what? Nobody is a mind reader here. Women love that. You know, they, they love a good man with good sort of assets. So be prepared to talk to them about your special qualities and, you know, what makes you a good person. You know, uh, kiss and tell if you need to. Wait, 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 wait. What's this kiss and tell stuff? Not talking about what you did sexually with your other girlfriends to the no, new no, one. No, no, no. But I mean, uh, she's not a mind reader. She doesn't know uh, what a great, amazing, incredible man you are. So tell her that. Show her that in your behavior. Be a gentleman, of course. Uh, don't be a doormat. I mean, nobody wants that. But, you know, be a man. Man up and tell her. We, we want to hear that. We want to see it. And then the second point to that is also make a mental or a written list of qualities that you genuinely desire in a woman. And you know what I must say? There's a lot of uh, single men out there. Unfortunately, they conflate scoring, getting laid, getting action with love, happiness, uh, and success in relationships. These are two very different things, but they get them confused. So in their pursuit of just, you know, it's kind of keeping score, right, of their prowess, let's say, they, I think they missed the point. Shouldn't be about playing the field to get some. You should be playing the field to find a, an incredible woman to share the rest of your life with. So uh, they need to sort of unconfl- deconflate that in their mind. And you need to know the woman that you're looking for because next time you see her, you go after her. And next time you see something uh, that does not fit on your list, don't go there. I think too many men just go wherever and then they end up with what they do and then they complain. So it's on you. You have yourself to blame and nobody else. 
Well, I think that last part you just mentioned probably isn't gender specific. I think a lot of women kind of follow their emotions into bad relationships, contrary to pure logic also. But I want to go back to what you said about a woman feeling the need for a guy to know about her hopes and dreams and wants and, and who the hell she is. And what I couldn't help have come to mind was this other often misconstrued notion that women often preach. It's almost like a mantra is I want a man who knows how to listen. <laughs> and guys are thinking, oh, well, this woman wants me to obey her and wants to put me under mm -hmm. her thumb. No, what she meant is what you just described. And you did so very, very eloquently. And then comes this other idea of men needing to be able to really put into an objective list, not only who the hell they are, but also who they're looking for. And you kind of said a lot of guys are thinking, hey, it's all about scoring. It's all about getting laid. I am amazed. I'm always amazed by the number of guys who I invite to take part in that very exercise and write me 10 traits that they're desiring in a woman. Mm -hmm. And 80% of the guys, even good men of character who mean well, Prady, are like, I got nothing. I don't know. <laughs> maybe TNA, maybe. That's all there is. And what these guys are doing is they're missing out on the richness of what women can provide above and beyond the sex. And when we appreciate women more on that holistic level, indeed, we have better sex and more of it, which mm. is perhaps the catch 22 for most men. Great, great stuff. We could probably talk about this for several hours. And I am sure that men, even if they're kind of off put a little bit by how differently you talk about it sometimes than we do around here, it really all comes down to manning up, appreciating femininity, femininity, appreciating masculinity, us having mutual respect for each other and our ability to relate as men and women and wait for it deserving what you want. You're not going to get the kind of woman you want, gentlemen, until you're the kind of man she's looking for. And Prady, I think uh, it's just an incredible, fun listen to hear you talk about men and women from your own perspective, not only from a woman's perspective, but uh, if the guys haven't figured that out yet, you're originally from overseas and you've come to America and you have that wonderful, rich cultural uh, ideal and sensibility about you that really looks for the deeper meaning within humanity in general. And I love that about you. And I think it's terrific. And by the way, guys, you need to look at her media picture too, in case you're having any preconceived notions about a woman like this and what she might look like. Go to mountaintoppodcast.com and take a look. And I also invite you to go to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash preety. And if you want the correct spelling, it's P-R-E-I-T-Y. But I also got your back if that's too many consonants and too many vowels mixed together in a weird way. You can put P-R-E-T-T-Y for all I care, and it'll take you directly to Preti Upala's Facebook group where you can opine with a bunch of other like-minded souls, both men and women, probably mostly women, about these thoughts. And if you like the combination of politics and spirituality, or perhaps even politics as spirituality, which you now know how Preti feels about that, I'm sure you can opine about that as well. So go to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Preti, P-R-E-I-T-Y, and... Uh, Get on board with that group. It'll probably be something different and a lot of fun. And Prady, thank you so much for joining us today. What a great conversation. I think these guys are really going to be gratified by it. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to converse with you, get your point of view. I'm actually an outlier in the way I think. Most women do not think like me. Um, I sort of uh, speak from a combination of different things, my own wisdom, my own background, and really looking at these issues and in great depth to find out what the problem is and what the solution can be. But hey, we are here for a divine plan and we ought to, uh, you know, get together and love each other, love yourself, uh, then alone can you love each other because the world is just but a mirror. And communication is the key. Remember that. I think we always forget that it's the simplest things that make the biggest difference. Uh, this uh, post-COVID or even during COVID, I think love is all we need. This is what we're finding out. So I wish all of you find love and light and please connect with me. I have a lot of content out there. Uh, you know, look me up and uh, I'd love to hear from you. So please do get in touch. And thank you for having me and love to be back on your show. I'm writing a book on this topic. And uh, when it's ready to 
roll out, I shall uh, hopefully appear and, and, and really talk about that as well with your audience. Oh, I, I think that would be a given. It would be wonderful to have you back. And once again, guys, go to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Preeti, P-R-E-I-T-Y, and learn more about her and what she's doing. And I agree, Preeti, you know, you probably are an outlier if for no other reason than if women are not feminists, they don't think much about it. <laughs> you know, they're onto something a lot more important to them, you know. So uh, I think that's definitely a, a solid perspective. So thank you once again. And guys, if you have not been to mountaintoppodcast.com in a while, it's been newly updated. Take a look at all our sponsors. Origin Maine, the good folks over there, are back in production with jeans and boots. And I know you guys have been waiting for that big announcement. They're back in the saddle, perhaps literally, over there. And uh, they are also giving you a free COVID-19 mask and fashionable denim with every order over $100. So definitely visit the guys at Origin at mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Origin, O-R-I-G-I-N. And you can use the very handy coupon code Mountain10 to get you some over there. Also, the guys over at Hero Soap. Hey, look, you're going to be out socializing again, and it's nice to have that new car smell for dudes about you. Use Mountain10 at mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Hero Soap. And we also want to give a shout out to our friends over at Keyport. Hey, if you've ever known that you needed a daily carry item, something to get you out of a jam and to be kind of that handy guy who's a hero to all. If you've ever known that in the past, now that you've gone through a crisis like a pandemic, you know even more than ever how much women love a man who can be a hero and can take care of things on the spot. And it's something our lovely guest today probably underscored also. So be sure to check out the Keyport Pivot. That's the one I personally use. It's really killer. It replaces your grandfather's simple pen knife for sure. www.mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Keyport. K-E-Y-P-O-R-T. And also while you're at mountaintoppodcast.com, you can check in to getting 25 minutes with me for free to talk about where you are right now, where you want to be. Maybe a coaching program is in your future. You can schedule that time with me right there on the spot, plus free reports and a chance to get my daily newsletter, which is fluff free, gentlemen, on how to get better with women and how to have the lifestyle you want and maybe even maximize your career potential. It's all there for you at mountaintoppodcast.com. Dot com. And until I talk to you again real soon, this is Scott McKay from X and Y Communications in San Antonio, Texas. Be good out there. The Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for The Mountaintop Podcast.